I'm not pioneering things, you know. All I'm doing is I'm continuing these conversations, I'm continuing the work, I'm continuing the advocacy, I'm continuing the community engagement. It's great, actually. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, it's setting, setting, the, setting the pace, setting the example, the resilience mm -hmm. of, of, of continuing to set the pace from those who've come before us. I do think of myself as uh, holding a space that is making space available for other people who identify with what I do. The same way we, we look for friends really in Australia and so just looking for people who understand uh, our experience. A few years ago when we rebranded as Diversity Arts Australia, one of the things that we really wanted to, to do was to centre culturally diverse artists in the advocacy work that we did. Centering artists as the people who would be, you know, kind of identifying key issues and creating works that um, were responding to those issues. The Pace Setters Project brought together four trailblazing artists, Ame Rahman, Kim Busty Beats Bowers, Rani Pramesti and Latai Tomapia and Fadia Abud also worked on the project at the beginning. So at the beginning of the project, Pascal Berry, who was the creative director and myself, I was the creative producer, came together and had some conversations about how we wanted to structure this. And we decided we would have an intensive um, kind of discussion with the artists over several days and we would present to them as part of that a series of provocations and so we then presented those to the creatives and we had some pretty phenomenal conversations. What all of the discussion seemed to keep coming back to was the erasure and exclusion of people of colour and First Nations people um, in the arts and creative sectors. That, that there had been these amazing pace setters that um, there had been these people who had made change, who we were kind of standing on the shoulders of, and without the work that had come before us, we wouldn't be able to be where we are, but that this work had been erased and was constantly being erased. What's been really important about this project and that's been identified by the artists themselves is the need to develop and archives, like an actual cultural archives that we care for we, and we develop and that we can have a space for these stories so that we can learn from what's happened in the past and build on that. And so it's given us a real kind of energy at Diversity Arts to really go for it and start, you know, imagining what this archive will look like, start dreaming it. So this project has been really, really significant and just kind of affirms the importance of Give, trusting artists and creatives to lead the work of advocacy and to inform it. So this event today shares the work that we've done as part of the Pace Setters project and also you know via the conversations with the artists who worked on the project um, we also get a sense of where it's what it's led to for them in terms of their practice and their work and through the conversations with the artists and creatives who have made work as part of the initial Pace Setters project we also get a sense of what impact this has had on, on them and what it's led to for them. The Pace Setters Project was an initiative started by Diversity Arts Australia, enabling artists to create works responding to themes such as race, diversity and inclusion in the Australian arts sector. In partnership with Blacktown Arts, Diversity Arts Australia officially launched the project at the Leo Kelly Blacktown Arts Centre. It was really fantastic to see all of the artists and the work that they were doing, uh, really inspiring and, and diving into those archives and seeing the, some of the histories that were being told. You know, the voices stand on their own. It created that kind of solidarity sense that sisterhood, brotherhood kind of sense. It creates much more kind of exciting dialogue in terms of the possibilities of where it can go later on. People have been fighting for change for a very long time in, and it happens in fits and starts, but um, there are precedents for that happening in Australia. We can't be kind of stuck in the same questions, in the same kind of problematics. Something has to move and something has to 
evolve into a much better conversation than, than either self-victimization or framing yourself as in the outer. It's a culmination of a process and they talked about the process as well as what's going to happen after and um, so I think what's important is that the event reflects the process and the process continues. It's about the depth and the breadth. And I'm actually really inspired by the fact that people can talk openly about this, this rage in this kind of setting because in a, in a lot of the work I do, it has to be done, it has to be done very covertly. You create safety so then you can take risks artistically and politically and culturally. So this kind of environment for the audience that you're asking me about it creates that, that energy. We have to stay true to our practices and that comes through our, our own communities, building our own communities of practice. The centre is us and that's our source of power. A great informa uh, information, um, especially um, a person of colour, just emerging towards the arts. Having this information with established artists of people of colour, um, it's, um, it's kind of enlightening and also um, exciting to see what's going to happen. I have a chance! <laughs> Hi, my name is Maria Tran and I'm a documentary filmmaker for the Pace Setters Project. I've been very lucky to have travelled the East Coast to meet up with our Pace Setters artists, get to know their practice as well as the context in which it lives in. Now, without further ado, I'd like to present the first documentary video that I did on Melbourne-based artist Rani Pramesti. Following that, she has a conversation with Pascal Berry. Please take a look. to Melbourne, I met up with Rani Pramesti, an independent performance maker, intercultural producer and an advocate for the arts. Rani has been developing creativesofcolour.com, a targeted place with curated conversations with creatives of colour. I want to get to know how you started, like, in the arts and, and your practice. I mean, was there a point where, you know, you felt like this is the field you want to go into? Was it like a, at a younger age? I'm, I'm a storyteller and um, I also work as an intercultural producer as well. You know, I'm really into working across different cultures because I think it's, it's like taking care of communities. That's what producing is for me, it's taking care of different communities, diverse communities. Yes, I'm very passionate about the arts. Yes, I tried for a really long time to actually not listen to that, that calling to be in the arts. But at the end of the day, I just kept feeling really pulled to be in the arts. I have a vision for what I want to do, you know, and I try and be an enabler for others as well. In my experience and the experiences of some of the people that I've interviewed for creativesofcolor.com, definitely navigating white institutions mm -hmm. and white spaces um, is a recurring theme. Like how that is actually a skill set because there are certain common white practices that if you're a white person and you're in it and you haven't been taught to see the things that you take for granted or the ways that you do that you take for granted. It's so complex, you can just keep um, unpacking every layer. But definitely a theme that comes up a lot in terms of people of colour navigating the arts is the fact of how the arts in Australia across the board tends to be predominantly white. So for people of colour, it's a skill set and it takes experience and their strategies for how to navigate those spaces. The project that you're working on, Creatives of Colour for Paysetters, is it? Mm -hmm. Tell us, like, how did you come up with that? So Lena Nahlus and Pascal Berry uh, approached me to make something. I have very rarely experienced where I am approached with a pool of funding and trust. And it spoke volumes because they were like, we think you're an interesting artist, can you make something? Yeah. And then they transferred the money to me. <laughs> yeah. I knew that I wanted um, 
it to involve people of color somehow. At the same time, I was having conversations with Pascal and Lena, right, as my ideas were evolving. And so eventually I pitched to them, I think I want to make a survival toolkit for people of color in the arts because I myself, I'm finding it so hard to keep going. I decided that, you know what, screw it. I'm just going to talk to people of color who have at least 10 years of experience mm -hmm. and I want to learn what are the strategies. I feel like your work is quite groundbreaking, but what's your thoughts on where your work is placed? Earlier you used the word pioneer mm -hmm. and I was just like, oh God, please don't call me that. Please don't call me that. Why and though? Why because, though? because there are a lot of elders, you know, who have been doing this work who have been having these conversations, who've been doing this advocacy, who've been coming up with modules. Some of them are working with Diversity Arts Australia, right? So I just see my, this work that we're doing as a continuation. I'm not pioneering things, you know? All I'm doing is I'm continuing these conversations, I'm continuing the work, I'm continuing the advocacy, I'm continuing the community engagement. You know, it's continuing a legacy that, that we are so blessed to have. Good evening, Rani. How are you? Hey, I'm okay, Pascal. Taking it day by day. I guess, you know, it's been two years since we spoke um, as part of Paysetters. Um, so I was wondering, um, how has your work um, uh, developed since 2019? Um, and how and what has the pandemic, um, and how has the pandemic affected you? Yeah, when it comes to creatives of colour, it's, um, whew, it's grown a lot since we last checked in. You know, at the time when we launched it at um, Blacktown Art Center, Creatives of Color was, you know, it was a website with five mm. interviews with creative women of color. Now we're in the middle of providing like 12 months of programming um, in response to the research um, that we did also in 2019. We conducted 60 um, in-depth interviews with creative people of color, a mix of First Nations, Black, um, and uh, people of color creatives mm -hmm. to identify what were some of the shared problems um, that um, creatives of color um, experience, you know, in navigating the predominantly white Australian art sector. And then throughout 2020, what we did was we started trialing activities that were designed as solutions to these problems. So for example, when one of the problems was um, a lack of our own shared spaces, which are, you know, affordable, accessible, and safer, we then decided to trial having a studio in Collingwood Yards, which is a brand new arts precinct um, in Col Collingwood on Wurundjeri Country. We were able to do one public event in our space before March 2020 and the first like shutdowns and cancellations. What we ended up doing was we moved everything online or we created opportunities that people could do by themselves or by phone or, you know, maybe walking one-on-one -on -one with someone within their 5k um, so that we could keep offering um, opportunities that were again designed as solutions to the problems that our research identified. I'm also really aware of the digital um, barriers that some groups face. You know, not everyone has a device to access the internet. Not everyone has access to internet, etc. Um, so that's why we also committed to making other opportunities that people could just, could just do in their own space without internet or digital literacy. Like what were your learnings from, um, from, from those processes and for the, from those projects? I think support for mental health is really crucial. And it was crucial even before COVID, you know. This time has just kind of really underlined the importance of mental health support that's something that I think we've always, we've been trying in the last two years, just keeping that up, keeping that up in, in the thread of, uh, as a thread in our work, that community connection care um, has been really top of mind. It, it, just, it's, it, it just seems really urgent. So I suppose maybe another learning is um, how can we be kinder on our, the expectations we put on ourselves and each other? from a future thinking kind of perspective, like what's, you know, what's in the horizon for you that you're looking forward to? Mm. So um, Creatives of Colour, we were successful in securing one of um, Australia Council's uh, Sector Recovery Initiatives grant. And um, it was for, it is, we're in the middle of it, a project called um, Justice Centred Design, 
where we're working with um, Arts Access Victoria, Music Victoria, and Collingwood Yards to develop a decolonial methodology. It's been a really woo, uh, mind expanding, like what kind of process? Because what I'm realizing through that is how we do change making work is just as important as what we do. We've been interviewing people and then out of those interviews, they've been inspiring drawings and visual maps, you know, as a decolonial method. And then Jackie Shepard from our team is um, doing some somatic patterns. And we're about to go to the next phase where we're now going to bring back these patterns to the people we've interviewed. And then we're going to create, I don't know, visual patterns together and somatic patterns together. It's been very exciting and I feel very blessed um, and privileged um, to be doing that work. Yeah. Ronnie, that was uh, a great way to end the conversation. Um, fantastic. <laughs> Looking forward to seeing what, what, what comes out of it, actually. Thanks, Pascal. Me too. I have no idea. <laughs> Which is part of the beauty. It's part of the beauty. <laughs> well, thank you. And um, you know, I suppose let's let's um let's observe what happens to pace setters from here on. Sounds good. <laughs> See you later. Thanks, Pascal and Rani, on the update on the pace setters in conversation. Next up, we have Sydney-based artist Latia Tomapea, who will be updating us on what she's been up to in the last two years, as well as a conversation with Pascal Barry. Take a look. In Cockatoo Island, Sydney, I spoke to Lataya Tume Piao, a self-professed kunaki, a body-centered performance artist. She is committed to bringing up the voice of marginalized communities to the forefront. So tell us a little bit about how you got involved in Paysetters. Yeah, Paysetters uh, approached me, I think it was a year ago, uh, yeah, and talked about making a new work um, that was with some other artists who I thought were really Great. It was a really great opportunity to look specifically at diversity in the arts. I started describing myself as a punake, which in my language is a highly revered person who works with movement, poetry, music, and is a composer and a choreographer. I was struggling with with the identity of dancer. Um, and at that time I, w I hadn't made a lot of work so I couldn't call myself a choreographer yet either. But I felt that those two terms were quite narrow. So rather than trying to explain to people, you know, what a you know, contemporary dancer is or, you know, a choreographer is, I, I use the term punake so then it keeps that word and that um, idea alive inside contemporary practice and I think actually that is more of a cultural way of looking at things you know like if it's a cultural dance or expression or movement in my language there are words that don't talk about whether things are dance or or music it's performance that is about the body in the center of it all now the themes of your work mm. we do a lot with environment climate change can you tell us a bit more about that I, you know, realise like coming from my cultural background, you know, being Tongan, that most of the works that we experience as art um, have very clear functions. You know, they tell narratives of, um, they document time, they help us understand where, what our ancestors did or how to, um, you know, exist inside a certain environment. So thinking about that um, and then starting to understand and hear about the impact of climate change, specifically in the Pacific um, and low-lying islands, I really felt a strong desire to start to make work and representations of what people were already experiencing. And so for me, it, mean, it meant that my work could have the function of, um, you know, speaking to the invisible.
I made, yeah, War Dance, The Final Frontier, an animation that was presented at Pace Setters. And I started to think about how the environment fights back for itself. And then I thought of the war dancers and I thought, what is, what would, what would that look like, you know? And War Dance became this animation that was about me performing these, uh, the choreography that I've taken from these dancers that is an ancient form of, you know, um, defending a place or environment. So how do you define pace at R and how do you explore it in your own way? It's a strange thing to think of myself as a pace setter. I do think of myself as uh, holding a space that is making space available for other people who identify with what I do, which is very important to me. So intergenerational relationships are very important to me. Hanging out with young artists who say to me, you know, like, oh, I saw your work and, you know, and I'm from the islands as well, I'm from the Pacific. I don't feel like I'm doing anything new. I'm continuing something, you know. And that's really interesting to me um, is to think about them as the pace setters, um, you know, and all this knowledge that I access from that is what's the pace setting. Particularly in Australia, there's been only enough space for one. And I feel like this is the problem. Like we need to move beyond first. You know, once there's two, three, four, then it's like the floodgates open. But I also do think that if we um, take risks in, in how we break some of those rules, like, like we learn things in the institutions and we, we can drop things as well. You know, we can make those stories, we can make those ideas that, um, that may have already been done, but we need to explore them as well. You know? So I feel like there's lots of room for new things within contemporary, contemporary making, contemporary arts. Um, and there's many spaces that we still need to diversify ourselves in, but I think we need to just keep holding that space and, and, and creating more spaces for us, you know, and it's, it's hard work. Mm. It's, it's gonna be hard, but like, you know, we're, we're getting there. I think we're really getting there. Hi, Bella Ty. how are you? Hi, Pascal, I'm well, thank you. How are you? I'm good, I'm good. I guess it's been two years since we spoke, um, well, since the Pace Setter event happened in Blacktown Art Centre. And um, I guess this is an opportunity for us to have a little bit of a chat about what have you been, what you've been up to over the last couple of years. We know that many things have happened um, unless you've been, unless we've been asleep under a rock, but um, <laughs> how has your work developed in, um, I mean, since 2019, um, when we had that last um, uh, pace at a uh, conversation, and how has the pandemic affected um, what you do or you're thinking about um, what you do? I, I think the pandemic has really created um, a lot of space to consider some things that we don't ordinarily have enough time to really consider. And that, so having these big shifts into digital work and making work online, some people are really good at doing that already. And I'm not one of those people, you know, life practice is my work and the environment is my work. So I can't kind of disconnect the problem of the pandemic um, from, you know, how we've contributed to that as an issue. So, you know, I spent a lot of time doing, um, actually accessing incredible First Nations talks online. That was like one of the most precious gifts, I think, of the pandemic that, that really, you know, um, held my practice in a, in a way that I, you know, was really unexpected. And of course, for myself, that was a way of generating an income for myself was also being, uh, you know, presenting guest lectures across our various universities and, and art spaces, you know, so, you know, so it did impact my practice in a way where it um, gave me some time to think more deeply about where I'm headed um, and and whether I wanted to be a part of an online 
um, or create an online version of my practice? And the answer to that is simply no. You know, it's not something I want to do. I mean, critically, you know, like what you touch on is is this notion that um, there's also something to learn around your own parameters in terms of the learning that there are those limitations. Are there things within the digital realm that um, perhaps um, you're, you're still fascinated by or do you think you've done your dash? No, I'm still fascinated by it, but I think there has to be a really, it has to be a good match with the idea. It's not just for the sake of um, making work. You know, the form of it has to match the thing that I'm trying to do. Of course, I'm I'm still very much fascinated, fascinated by it and, you know, continue to co try and um, collaborate with people who are doing some really wonderful things in that area. But it has, there has to be a good reason for it. Mm. Is there anything new on the horizon, you know, like some compelling kind of project that you want to share with us? Well, I mean, I, you know, today was just announced that um, I'm the recipient of the Sydney Maya Creative Fellowship. And thank you to you for being my incredible nominator. You know, the environmental work is part of the performance practice um, for, you know, and what I've been really interested in is ideas of responding to systemic change that isn't necessarily in the same way that I've been working. Um, and so some of that is also working a lot more quietly. I, I really, I, I was supposed to st start a short course in horticulture, you know, in TAFE this year, which just hasn't happened. But, you know, like, you know, just this reinvestment in skills and following ways of becoming more dependent on oneself i think is is really important and thinking about you know the next decade and also you know as you as you said in previous conversations that it is an opportunity to um replenish your reserves yeah i think there's a parallel of what we do to the planet and what we do to artists so i think one of the biggest takeaways this, you know, has been about resisting that and taking the time to to recalibrate and really understand, yeah, no, I don't want to go back to what we've been doing. Yeah, I think that's that's one of the biggest things that we've we can show for the time that we've spent, um, you know, under under that rock. Hey, that's all, thank you so much. And we'll end it there in a wonderful kind of sense of optimism about restoring ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pascal and Latire for the dialogue and conversation. Next up, we have Gold Coast based artist Busty Beat Bowers' documentary, followed by a conversation with Pascal Berry. They make one story become the only story. Gold Coast, I was able to chat with Kim Busty Beat Bowers, a creative artist and performer of the international smash hit Hot Brown Honey. So you were one of the participants for the Paysetters. What was your sort of journey and, and your the process of you getting on board? Uh, Paysetters was a really interesting and fun and um, reflective project I found. We started that process kind of a year before where we uh, got together, the artists got together and actually had quite an amazing few days at Blacktown Art Centre. There's this real need uh, for us to reflect and archive and actually recognise that we as, you know, the broader community, as people of colour, as like artists uh, within the western suburbs have actually been here the whole time. Like what, what some of the challenges have you sort of faced, especially mm -hmm you know, being a woman of colour and, mm. and, and continuing your practice. Many, many times I've thought, eh, I've got to quit. Mm. Like, there's just like, that there's a real lack of recognition, uh, a lack of understanding and a lack of care, which is actually what we talked about in Paysetters a lot, like the care factor 
for artists, especially coming from many different backgrounds. It's been hard, but there's something inside of me and I really see it inside of the artists that I am around is that there is such a need for us to put our stories, like whether it be on stage, on film, uh, in written form, like we, we need to have our stories told and we need to tell them ourselves. It's really been about kind of working out um, which fights to fight mm. and also how to go about it. We decided with Hot Brown Honey that the battlefield was the stage and we were gonna use it as such. We also love to kill people with kindness. <laughs> So we've kind of come out of left field and made this kind of smash hit show. What was the genesis of mm. this show? Definitely came from feeling oppressed. <laughs> <laughs> and like also Lisa and I going, we make such kooky, political, uh, sometimes taboo in both our, in our culture's work as well. Um, and um, so we were always on the fringes and on those fringes, we just met so many amazing artists of colour doing all this beautiful work. Um, and we were just like, right, so how do we strategically go about saying we should be centre stage? <laughs> Like we put it put it down on a plan. We actually put it down in a grant. We didn't get the grant, but we did play at the South Lake Centre. Amazing, because yeah. it just makes me think that it's, it's important for us to dream big. At yeah. the same time, like that fear of like failing. Like, mm. how do we mm. get around it? You think? Yeah, mm. um, it's really hard because what, what I feel is that like because artists have been pushed out for so long of the mainstream they've kind of we've all created our own worlds what we're doing on the outside as outsiders as outliers mm -hmm. is actually um creating the goods mm -hmm. yeah so we've we do have the opportunity from not being so always in that mainstream space to mm -hmm. to make awesome work mm -hmm. Now the term pace setters, what, what have you arrived mm. to understanding um, that term? It's great actually. It's like, you know, it's setting setting the setting the pace, setting the example, the resilience of, of, of continuing to set the pace from those who've come before us. And then why do you think it's so like significant and important to have things like this? Like we have to remember and even for young ones coming up, I'm like we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Actually, there's a whole lineage, knowledge and understanding that can be brought back into today. You're not by yourself, you know, you, there, there are amazing artists all around you and have been there the whole time. Hey. Hello. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Look, I haven't seen you since 2019 and I guess, you know, like it would be great to sort of, you know, catch up on, you know, um, what you've been up to in, um, you know, I guess over the last couple of years since I saw you last and, and importantly, you know, like how did, um, you know, the COVID whole kind of like the pandemic, um, you know, change things for you? I mean, you know, that pace setters and the pace setters event was quite important in kind of what my own uh you know just looking at my own artistic practice and the practice of the, my peers and people around me as well um yeah and then COVID hit and then um it was sort of for me and for like my crew hop brown honey we had a whole kind of international tour uh that was going to go up and we were about mm -hmm. to kind of move into that um, new world of like really large scale gigs, festival, big festivals. Yeah, it kind of just went into a real time of relooking, you know, readjusting, uh, just taking time actually. Mm. And what we found was that, um, I don't know when artists became the foot soldiers of capitalism, but you know, <laughs> everything, it was very clear, everything in the world that was happening was happening to artists and creatives first. Mm. And that's continued along the way. And I always say it, I'm like, arts has the capacity to transform culture. I suppose what came to the surface and what continues to come to the surface during these times is, 
the inequity of everything really and how, how structures aren't working for anyone. Mm. But because the arts and um, people, creative peoples are, are the tipping point, we actually have the capacity to now form a way forward, transform the world. For like, let's go for the absolute ultimate of what we, what would be the best um, for people for safety, inclusion, and equity. You know, what do you think we were like? I suppose the most important kind of learning um, in terms of like how it's, um, I suppose, influenced your your own like meth- methods and processes. It really affected me, actually. Like, I can't say it didn't. The kind of stress was massive, <laughs> but it did make me really delve into uh, my practice and delve into uh, the way um, I wanted to continue to move through the world and how that worked with a lot of, I suppose it's like collective creative power, really finding that there were um, a number of collectives of people across the globe who were having these really uh, important conversations um, around uh, practice, around um, how to make things better, about you know, transformational understandings within arts practice. So that was quite amazing, being able to talk with so many people via Zoom, <laughs> like, you know, about what was going on. And it's almost like, I guess, the the um, the online kind of world connected you to people that you may not have kind of connected with previously, right? Yeah, definitely, definitely. You know, we were all kind of freaking out and <laughs> <laughs> at the same time, but then also going, okay, you know, this is actually a, a time of, you know, absolutely being, uh, you know, devastated in a financial sense and, and really seeing those massive inequalities in the arts where, like, you know, it, whole institutions were just closing their doors and, like, cutting off contracts or cutting off, like, any sort of contact where mm-hmm. I feel like in the, especially the independent sector, that people just continue to make excellent work that spoke to what was what has been going on what's in the horizon for you like what's what's the next project next project got a couple of little projects which is great I just came off the demolition project with uh, polytoxic and that was really just you know had a great vibe they really set up um, these amazing structures and held moments within the rehearsal room and really created that safe space. And, you know, because it was like a a cast that that crossed sort of uh, race, gender and cultural identity, it just became really um, almost like a little microscope of like how how good things can happen. (laughs) I worked on a work last year called uh, Seven Methods of Killing Kylie Jenner by Jasmine Jones. You know, the whole, the cast and crew were all women of colour. So great to hear it's going up because you just, you just don't know. (laughs) It's going to do a little tour as well. So that's really exciting. I'm working on an album for an artist now called Ancestress. Ancestress is an amazing Birigaba Kungaloo uh, artist. It's Dr. Lilla Watson and Dr. Mary Graham. And they, they've created this work together. Basti, thank you so much. And, um, Thanks for giving up, uh, giving up a moment of your time. Um, and I will speak to you very soon. Yay, excellent. Thank you, Pascal and Busty Beat Bowers. Last but not least, we have our final artist, Ameh Rahman, who will be presenting to you a documentary that he made himself interviewing a series of artists. Please have a look. Amir Rahman is an Australian comedian and writer. His shows selling out at festivals. His work documents the experiences of several creatives as they navigate the Australian artistic space as people of colour. As part of my work, I interviewed three good friends of mine, Dr. Gary Foley, Beverly Wang and Nazim Hussain. And we talked about race, art, culture and navigating whiteness in Australia. And I would never see another non-white face. And if I did see another one non-white face, more often than not it was another Aboriginal person. You know? So Sydney was a very white, white place. Comedy's got to be directed one way as an ethnic comedian. You often only expect to laugh at yourself, make jokes about you and your family. Um, so if you start to, I don't know, I've done, done that now, this next sketch is about you, 
you can cop a lot of crap. Turn on the TV in, in a big city in Canada or a big city in the States, and you're gonna hear non-Anglo names, and you're gonna see a few more non-white faces, right? But here it was just like, it was just wall to wall on commercial television, especially. You know, as someone who's not white, making, well, well just, making any kind of art, but then making like, you know, trying to do sort of overtly political art. Um, it's just, Australia is just a very, very difficult space to exist in, you know, just, just as far as trying to make a living off your work. You know, it's just such a, it's such a small space anyway. Even if I look at comedy, even for a mainstream comedian, you know, there's just, there's just not much in terms of platforms or outlets or, you know, um, exposure that you can get in a place like Australia, in Australia, in Australian media. And then on top of that, if you add like one more factor that makes you different in some way, that makes you niche or, you know, uh, alternative in some way, it makes it that much, that much harder. So, you know, I think as artists, we're always looking for anyone who gets what we're doing. And it doesn't have to be another artist. It can be, you know, someone who's, you know, just people in, in other fields or, or, or whatever. It's the same way we, we look for friends, really, in Australia. It's just like, just looking for people who understand uh, our experience. So, you know, Nazim and Beverly and Gary, like, they're all people that I've, you know, either, well, that I'm very close to personally, but also have worked with politically and artistically, um, or who have supported me, you know, in different ways. So, yeah, I just thought it would be great to, to have those conversations, but just kind of get them on film um, for other people to see. I think a lot of people just give up because it's not tenable, it's not sustainable to make your art in a vacuum um, where it's not being appreciated, it's not being seen by the right people, it's not being given its due. Hey, I'm here. how are you? <laughs> Hi, how's it going? I'm good. Like I, um, I guess um, it'd be good to kind of talk about I suppose how the last couple of years have mapped out for you and um you know in terms of the reality of COVID has that you know affected the things that you do yeah um so I I had just started doing stand-up about four months before the pandemic uh and then yeah obviously like everyone else just completely stuck in shock no idea when anyone was going to be able to perform again um and yeah I mean I'm lucky because I do other freelance work, but mm -hmm. for my friends who are, you know, full-time professional performers, um, just watching, you know, major festivals get canceled and just knowing like how much of their like annual income um, they were losing, that was, yeah, it's been, obviously it's been really hard for, for everyone. And has your video work continued over the last couple of years in terms of what you were doing for pay setters? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I that, that's the, the kind of work that I do anyway, sort of freelance um, video and, and media work, but I haven't, not in a creative sense. I mean, that's just kind of been what's paying the bills. Has there been a kind of major learning about, um, I suppose, about aspects of, um, aspects of your practice, I suppose, that you've kind of um, really sort of thought about over the last couple of years? The thing for me is that I had been on a long break before the pandemic mm. um, so it really it took a lot for me to get back on stage you know, you know when you lose momentum as an artist particularly as a comedian or maybe like a um a, a writer or, or live performer the more the more you stay out of it just the harder it is to get back on stage and and um it, it's not like riding a bike where you just mm. just pick up where you, where you left off so that is the hard part is that is knowing that the longer you're not doing it, the longer it's going to take for you to get back to maybe where you were um, in terms of your ability and your confidence and stuff like that. But I, I think this time around, at least everyone was in the same in the same boat and also watching people adapt, you know, in ways that I that I was really surprised by, you know, people doing comedy over Zoom and um you know without a live audience and which i really really respect there's no way i could i could do it like i can't you know you never try um, the digital output no i just i i know and i know a lot of other comedians are like i can't i can't do it but like for the ones who can i was like i was really impressed like, but i guess it kind of misses that kind of um the agency of liveness i suppose isn't it like in terms of when you're reacting from 
a live audience. There's no, there's no substitute. People, I've seen people do stand up on Clubhouse as well, which is like right. just audio. People have been forced to adapt in all kinds of ways. Mm. I guess, you know, the last question I have for you is um, what's up next? Uh, hopefully a new show, if I can get it together. Everything I've experienced in the last few years has just been pointing me back at getting on stage. In a kind of global context, are you thinking of coming coming back here in Australia or what's what's the plan? Honestly, I just don't see Australia as like a long-term prospect for me. You know, like especially with a family now, like moving back and like, I don't think there's a way for me to, me to like particularly me to make like a sustainable kind of mm. living in Australia. It's just too hard, you know, at least out here, like, you know, travel is cheaper. It's easier for me to see people. It's, it's not as isolated, but I would, I would still like to work in Australia. Like if I had a, if I had a show, I'd like to bring it out there. Mm. Um, or, you know, I'd like to write for TV or whatever, stuff like that. But I just don't see it as something I can do like long-term. In terms of uh, reflecting back on this idea of being a, being a pace setter, um, <laughs> um, what does it mean for you to kind of, um, you know, be, be doing this practice to a wider audience, I suppose, you know, like, you know, outside of the Australian context? Well, the two biggest issues for me in Australia, obviously, like one, the cultural one, like where like the mainstream Australian mindset is. Um, if you want to do any art that's like vaguely not mainstream, um, and just the size of the audience, you know, if you're already performing to like a smaller niche, you know, in Australia, how tiny that is. It's not that those countries are more, much more progressive or, or whatever, but they've just got bigger populations. So yeah. my niche is bigger. My niche is bigger in the US or in the, in the UK. Well, um, sounds like you have a plan. So um, good luck with everything. And um, we'll be showing your, your films, obviously, during um, Pace Setters. And um, uh, I think one of the really interesting things about, um, I suppose one of the, the results of 2019 is the development of an archive. Um, so it's an exciting kind of um, proposition that there might be an archive of really exciting kind of works that is being developed right now. So thanks for being part of it. No, my pleasure. That wraps it up for our online Paysetters program. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you so much to our creative artists who have been involved, people behind the scenes, the coordinators, the crew, as well as the project and organizational supporters. We could not have done this without you. Once again, it is so vital that artists have moments and gaps in their trajectory to be able to reflect, archive and recognize and have their work on the center stage. Thank you.